bullish on mission produce question mark that is the question we're going to be looking at today this is a avo stock analysis this company recently went public it's an avocado company this is stalker finance i'm your host david Scheuer. make sure to follow me on twitter at stalker finance or support the channel at patreon.com slash stalker finance so let's move on here and yes i already told you this but this is a avocado company mission uh, they grow, they import avocados to the U.S. as well as other parts of the world. Um, it's kind of known as the Exxon Mobil of the avocado industry. So they refine it. They, uh, they even have ripening facilities where they ripen the avocados to make sure that they're just perfect when they get to the grocery stores for their consumers to buy. You know, you never want to buy avocado that you have to wait a week to eat because it's so hard. Or you don't want to buy one that's overly ripe and all squishy when you get it. And then it's, uh, you know, kind of trash. So let's move on here, though, and we're going to be looking at its S1 form. It doesn't really have much information now, and there's a lot of very consolidated and quote-unquote adjusted numbers on this form. That's one thing they just want to watch out for when looking at these uh, these forms before a company goes public. Now, this company already is public, and it went public, uh, I believe, on October 1st, so a few days ago. And if we look here, it says that the, there's a $6.5 billion uh, in the avocado industry in the U.S. market. Uh, it's a, it has a 9% CAGR for U.S. consumption, 13.5 billion global avocado market. So it looks like the U.S. market is a substantial part of that. And um, we can tell that the volume is growing, you know, revenue or revenue and CAGR is growing substantially with volume up 13%, revenue up 14% as well. A vertical integration with over 10,000 acres. So that's what I was talking about with the, you know, growing it, refining it, ripening it, going all the way to the grocery store, et cetera. The kind of the entire thing similar to ExxonMobil does with oil. But in this case, our oil is avocados. Now let's move on to their introduction here. They said they're a world leader in sourcing, producing, distributing fresh avocados, serving retail, wholesale, et cetera, in over 25 countries. They produce, pack, distribute avocados to our consumers and provide value-added services, including ripening, bagging, custom packaging, um, logistical management. In addition, we provide our customers with merchandising and promotional support, et cetera, et cetera. Our operations consist of four packaging facilities in the United States, Mexico, and Peru, 11 distribution and ripening centers across the U.S., Canada, and China, and the Netherlands. So they're a very global co uh, company right now, as well as three sales offices in the U.S., China, and the Netherlands. We own over 10,000 acres in Peru, of which over 3, 8,300 acres are currently producing primarily avocados, and the remaining are green fields that we intend to plant and harvest over the next few years. Since our founding in 1983, so it's a pretty old company as well, which is good to see this company is very established. We have focused on long-term growth, innovation, and strategic investments in our business and reliable execution in our, in our commitments to suppliers and customers. We operate with a strong and growing avocado industry and have played a major role in many of the industry's innovations over the last 30 years. For example, we believe we're the first U.S. company to import avocados from Mexico, Peru, and Chile, and we're the first to incorporate ripening centers to the distribution process. Now, that's got an interesting statement at the end there, since they say we believe we were. Um, there's a company I'm going to talk about at the end here that I'm going to compare to this one. They were founded in 1929, and there's some others that were founded you know, before then that grow avocados, etc., or throughout the 1900s. So it's it's kind of, you know, we believe we were. That's kind of like, okay, we didn't do anything, any research, but we can just assume we're the first company. But whatever, that statement's not that important. We're more interested in the numbers, and we'll get into that here. So first off, let's take a look at the avocado industry. And this is according to their S1 form as well. So keep that in mind. Now, they said the total market value has grown from four, and this is in million, so 4.9 billion to 6.4 billion. And that's just in the US as well. So that's good that we see a growing industry there. On top of that, the total avocado sales by product origin, we see the domestic production has grown as well. But the main thing is imports have grown substantially from 1900 to 2200. And we see the total growing substantially as well. Uh, the top avocado imports by country of origin, you can see that Mexico pretty much dominates the entire list. Then Peru, as they talked about, they have like 10,000 acres there. Then Chile, then uh, Dominican Republic, Colombia, and other is basically nothing down there. With a total of 1,900 in 2015, and then 2018, 2,200. And I assume it's probably grown since then as well over the past couple of years. If we move on here, we see per capita avocado consumption in pounds. We see that Mexico is the largest consumption per per capita most likely that's because um they do a ton of avocado growing there as we saw in this last slide here imports by country of origin mexico is one of the largest importers of avocados and so most likely that means avocados are probably substantially cheaper in mexico which means they're consuming more as well as their population is significantly less than that of the u.s who is next in line at 
eight avocados uh, or eight pounds of avocados per, per capita there i guess and uh, korea in last there now if we move on here we see the uh avocados by top importing markets in millions of pounds uh, we see the us has imported a ton we consume a lot of avocados in the eu canada japan and part of that is just because there's such a huge trend such a hip thing in the us as, as well as the us has a lot of spending power in terms of uh uh u.s consumers compared to other places around the world especially when you you know compare it to places in uh, in china uh, in chile and korea as well the u.s has a lot of spending power and we also love to spend money and we love to eat you know random little hip trends like avocados etc um now i'm not hating on avocados as, as all you know i i'm definitely on that trend i like my avocados put a little salt on that put it on some toast etc let's move on though so now we can go ahead and look at avocado growing season for top exporting countries and export volume as well as the california growing season and production in millions of pounds and this was in 2019 again mexico pretty much dominates that in terms of export volume and then we see peru and at the bottom there we actually see california california is a pretty good uh, grower of avocados as well this is kind of their growth strategy here in Europe. They say they plan to grow their distribution uh, facilities. They're going to grow, uh, you know, more avocados, et cetera, uh, import more to Europe. We believe our seasonal customer programs will help us continue to build our existing relationships and attract new customers across Europe. They plan to expand throughout the region. They believe growing scale will enable them to make more direct, ripe, and bulk deliveries of their avocados and to uh, of our avocado produce to retail customers in asia they said they have a long-standing presence in asia with over 35 years in japan over five years in china and korea we expect to maintain and strengthen our relationship with distributors in japan and korea and believe our existing chinese distribution facilities will serve as a platform upon which we can continue to build our avocado distribution network in other uh, markets they can continue to evaluate opportunities to capitalize on growing demand in other international markets with a focus to expand our operations in south america we believe chile represents an attractive opportunity for growth as one of the world's top avocado consuming countries and we believe we are well positioned to be a long-term provider of avocados in that region so now let's move on to some numbers here this is when it really starts to get interesting so we see their net sales there and it looks very nice we see fiscal year ended 2018 to 2019 a you know not a huge growth but a pretty nice growth from and this is in thousands i believe so it's 859 million to 883 million you know it's a, it's a good growth it's not anything crazy though we're not seeing 100 growth 50 percent growth but this is an old established company it's not a tech company or something like that it's going to experience crazy growth we just like to see slow and steady growth in this type of company but then we see nine months ended as of 2019 to 2020 it's actually um, grown from 651 million to 655 million which is great as well and if we move down though then we see gross profit which is grown as well for in uh, 2018 to 2019 from 85 million or sorry uh 53 million to 154 million but then in 2019 to 2020 nine months ended we see 111 million to 85 million so that's kind of confusing there because 2019 did a lot of sales i'm not sure if 2019 was just a substantial really great year and i know it was a great year economically throughout the u.s especially but it's kind of interesting that it just suddenly plummets to 85 million as of nine months ended uh perhaps it'll pick up towards the end of the year here remember we just missed some of the avocado uh season like, i don't know i'm not really huge into the avocado industry i'm not an avocado analysis uh, analyst by any means but that's really interesting and a little bit concerning it gets a little more concerning as well when you see selling general administrative expenses increasing as well from 2018 to 2019 are uh, pretty substantially from 35 million to 48 million and then in nine months ended as of 2019 to 2020 we see 37 million to 39 million and then if we go down to net income well we see it start to decrease from 72 million to 71 million in 2018 to 2019 and then in 2019 2020 nine months ended we see 47 million to 10 million so that's pretty concerning there that there's that big of a decrease in net income over the longer scale of things if you look at that and we'll probably see that in a second here on one of these upcoming slides they are growing pretty substantially and doing steady growth but recently that is a bit of a concern that their margins seem to have pretty much been obliterated there since their net sales grew but their net income just plummeted and you see that in net income per share as well from 75 cents to 16 cents and previously from a dollar 37 to one a dollar 13 from 2018 to 2019 so that's definitely a little concerning there and if we go down here there's so much adjusted 
um, things going on. And I just kind of want to ignore a lot of these numbers. Um, the only one I'm not going to ignore is the combined gross profit per pound, which has increased from 2018 to 2019. But then again, in 2019 to 2020, we see that decrease pretty substantially. So perhaps there was an influx of avocados. Maybe avocados flooded the industry, or there was too many grown that year, and they imported way too many to the U.S., which plummeted the price per avocado. And that would result in significantly lower margins, which despite you know higher sales, since more avocados are in the U.S., you're going to see significantly uh less profit being made per avocado which means their net income could plummet along with that so perhaps that's part of the issue that's going on i'm sure if i did more research into that i could maybe prove that or i could find out if that's the case or if there's something else going on there but that's my biggest theory as of right now please let me know if you have more information on the avocado industry especially regarding uh this company here avo Let's move on here. So now we see their balance sheet. And when they say consolidated balance sheet, well, they really took the word consolidated to heart. I mean, this is basically as consolidated as you can get for an S1 form. I usually like to see, you know, current assets and current liabilities. So I can do more, uh, do more math, do more information. And I really had to dig up data from, you know, third party websites to find information about this. But this is all they gave us was total assets, you know, shareholders equity, some long term debt and, you know, cash and cash equivalents, which they're required to give on this form. So in terms of cash and cash equivalents, they have a significant amount of cash. That's great. So from 2018 to 2019, they grew from $26 million to $64 million in cash. And then um, and now they have about $36 million in cash. They're most likely spending a bunch of money getting prepared for the IPO and for some other things as well. So I'm not surprised by that. They also were dealing with this whole, you know, situation that we're in, the economic collapse that happened briefly in March as well. So definitely, you know, the recession going on. I'm not surprised that people are probably spending significantly less money on avocados. And that could be part of the reason why they had so much less net income uh, compared to 2019 as well. It's because if people have less money, I don't think people are going to go spend, you know, avocados are pretty expensive these days. The price per avocado, as we saw, increased substantially over the past few years. So to go ahead and you know spend a bunch of money on avocados when you're struggling to pay rent or whatever it might be, well, that's not going to happen. So I'm not surprised that there's just been less avocados sold in the past few months than previously. So that could definitely be part of it, especially in the spring and summer when people want their avocado toast, want to go sit outside, etc. So let's move on here. We see shareholders equity of 313 to 379 and then briefly decreased to 378, but not a big deal there. Uh, that's pretty solid that we see a growth in total shareholders equity. And if we look at net sales again, well, we're seeing, uh, we kind of already went over this, actually. I think we, uh, I think I had a double slide there. My bad. So let's move on here. We're going to do the NCAVPS calculation. And first off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this right here, the consolidated balance sheet. I'm going to go ahead and take the total assets, which was 697747 So $697,747,000 dollars minus total liabilities, which is $319,134,000. And that's going to give us a shareholder's equity of $378,613,000. I took the total outstanding shares of $69,350,000. And we're going to take the shareholder's, shareholder's equity, divide it by the total outstanding shares to get a per share price. And this is a net current asset value per share price of $5.45. Now, usually when you're a value investor, you're going to look for companies who are trading less than that because this is essentially your liquidation value. So if a company is trading less than the liquidation value, well, perfect. That means if you were to buy preferred shares of that stock and that company, you know, decided to liquidate all its assets, et cetera, uh, whatever might happen there, well, then you would make an automatic return on that investment. And most likely your hope is that the stock price actually returns back to above its liquidation value, giving pretty much you know, it's like paying 10 cents for a dollar. So that's the hope when you look at a value investment. That's not the case with this company, and that's no surprise. Since this IPO, you know, had a pretty substantial IPO when the shares went up 20% there. So it's currently trading at $12.65, significantly greater than, and I have the greater than or less than signed backwards there, significantly uh, greater than $5.45, but not a huge issue to worry about there. Um, the market cap of this company is currently 874 million, so it's less than a billion dollar company, which means it could have a little more room to grow if we look at its competitors in a second here. A healthy P ratio of just $25 per share, 52 week high, $15. Again, it went public on October 1st, I believe, and then a 52 week low of $11.75, which is now slightly recovered from. So if we move on here and we look at some other stats, we can see it's a gross margin of 17% operating or a profit margin of just 3%. So I'd really like to see that profit margin increase substantially. But for a, you know, a company that's dealing with uh, you know, importing avocados, farming, et cetera, I'm not surprised there's a very low profit margin. Uh, grocery store products almost always have a low profit margin. 
then we're looking at uh, the PS ratio of 0.99, which is really good. A PS ratio under one is considered excellent usually, so that's fantastic. And a, uh, uh, a book value there, sorry, choked a little bit, of 2.33. And under three is considered pretty decent. Some value investors will con will you know take interest in a company that has a book uh, a price to book ratio of under three. So 2.33 th is not too bad there. Now let's move on here. We see free cash flow, uh, pretty substantial increase from 2018 to 2019 from 5 million to 63 million. And we also see cash and cash equivalents increase. We see total debt decrease, which is great as well. Um, then we go ahead and we see assets increase. We also see liabilities increase slightly, but not as fast as assets are increasing from 2018 to 2019, which is fantastic as well. And we see book value increasing as well, which is awesome to see. It just depends what's going to happen with this year. It's been a very interesting year. People aren't spending as much money, etc. So we'll see if this holds true once 2020 ends. Now, let's go ahead and look at a competitor here just to get a little comparative analysis going. It has a market cap of 1.21 billion, a dividend also of 1.6, which is pretty attractive there, and a 52-week high of $95, but a 52-week low after the crash of just $48. It is Calivo Growers Inc. It's a pretty interesting company to actually take a look at as a growth stock as well. The ticker symbol is CVGW. And it's, uh, you know, it's up about 900% since it first went public, which is fantastic over the, uh, I believe if we go here, over the past five years, up about 100% before the crash. So a pretty nice return there, honestly. And um, yeah, not too bad of a company to take a look at. Substantial growth here, you know, year over year and quarter over quarter, especially the trailing 12 months growth. So if we go ahead and look at revenue growth, you know, 2013, they did 691 million. Now they're doing one point, you know, one, nearly 1.2 billion as of 2019. And we go ahead and see the same thing with gross profit growing, net income growing as well, although a little more volatile than it was before. But still, you know, they had negative net income back in 2013, and now they're positive um, 36 million there. And if we go ahead and look at basic EPS as well and earnings per share, we see that is growing as well, which is great to see. Um, cash on hand, 7.9 million or 7.9 billion total assets as well. But one thing you're going to notice here is that shareholder equity is less than the company that we were looking at AVO. And so because of that, we could perhaps make an assumption, even though they're doing less revenue here, they have pretty similar financials to that of AVO. And I think part of the reason their stock is trading higher is simply because they offer a dividend, which will, you know, uh, increase shareholders likely or increase, increase investors likely wanting to invest in the company because they're paying a dividend. So, I think um, that, that's a pretty good, you know, little comparative analysis to make there. It doesn't give us too much information, but it's nice to take a look at a competitor who's been around for longer and who's, you know, been a public company for longer as well to just see how they've performed over the years. Now, here's a summary of AVO. So we need more information. I really am looking forward to their, you know, uh, their quarterly earnings just to see how they're doing. There's been a lot that's gone on over the past, you know, few months. So I want to see how that's affected the avocado industry as well as their company individually. Um, I want more information about that. Then will the avocado trend continue? Avocados are super popular in the US, but as people you know, have to save more money because of this recession that's going on, as well as the fact that people have had to, uh, you know, pe pe avocados are getting simply more expensive as well. So not as many college students are able to afford eating avocados. If you have to choose between, you know, white rice and avocados, you're probably gonna have to choose the bulk, <laughs> bulk rice. Uh, anyways, um, it's undervalued compared to this competition slightly. I don't want to say it's super undervalued, but it is a little undervalued, especially when you look at its shareholders equity and cash in hand, as well as its, you know, growth year over year. Uh, then we go ahead and see the NCA VPS, the net current asset value per share, which is less than the current share price. Not super worrying, but that is something, you know, this isn't an amazing just value investment to say the least, although it could be an interesting growth investment. It's an interesting company to keep a watch on. I've never really done an analysis of a stock like this or in the avocado industry. It was kind of fun doing it. So definitely um, an interesting company to watch. I'm going to keep paying attention to this industry and has an increasing book value year over year, uh, which is pretty substantial as we saw from 2018 to 2019, especially. So anyways, guys, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Make sure to check out these videos. Tweet at me at Stocker Finance if you have any questions or comments or comment below as well if you have any opinions on this company or more information. Patreon.com slash Stocker Finance if you want to help support this channel. Got some good stuff over there. Anyways, thanks for watching and peace out.